Um, so I know a little bit about you, you know a little bit about me. Um, the next sort of hour um, is partly me standing in the dark peering at you and uh, trying to put some ideas into your head. Um, this is the bit where I do talk very quickly if I get excited. So do wave at me and I'll try and slow down. Um, what I want to do is uh, talk a bit about why there is more and more and more arts work with older people, whatever an older person is. Um, I want to talk a bit about why it's important. I'm going to talk a little bit about what's the most interesting and also uh, what's kind of at the edge, I think. And also what's next here. So uh, I lived in Dublin for a long time. I lived in Sligo for years and years and years. I've worked in Derry. I've worked in uh, Donegal. I've, I know some of the people in the room. And what I know is that actually some of you people are um, kind of world leaders, really. And it's really important that we start off by recognising that. So we start off by saying that uh, what happens here, what people have been doing here, continue to do, is extraordinarily important. Um, and you need to have the chance to continue doing that. There are two reasons for this. One is that the regular having a group that meets every week that you can go to becomes incredibly important as your geography shrinks, that you can find someone to go to, you can find a thing to go to. It's equally important that something comes in from outside, because if this is all that happens, eventually it gets a bit stuck, gets a bit boring. And so you need a play between the two. So uh, I wanted to kind of celebrate, because it's incredibly important that we celebrate all of these organizations. And if I've missed an organization out, I apologize. It was put together in a bit of a hurry. Um, but I know there's an awful lot happens here already, and has happened for a long time, and continues to be uh, really valuable. Quite often when I do something like this, people will say, we heard about this really pro great project in Scandinavia. That Scandinavia must be an amazing place. There must be incredible things happening in Finland, because every time I go to somewhere, people say, there's this amazing thing in Finland. There are amazing things in Finland. They're no more amazing than here. And as we uh, get older, as, we, as the population changes shape, the fact that we build from where we are, that we build from where we're standing, that we make creative actions and choices from where we are ourselves, is, if you take nothing else out, that's a starting point. So, why is this all happening? Because we are a miracle. You and me, we're a mir miracle. We're a miracle of public health. We live longer, better, than our grandparents and great-grandparents. Well, we live longer for definite. And it's happening all around the world. It's particularly happening in America, Australia, Japan, China. Uh, people live a lot longer. And it changes so many things fundamentally. So uh, people who are 50 can expect to live another 40 years. And what's happening in the next couple of years is there will be more people over the age of 65 than there are under the age of five. This never happened before. It's never happened in one area of the world, anywhere, that there are more people, 65 and plus, than there are under five. And a lot of those people will be 80, 85 and plus. The biggest growing area is 80, 85 and plus. I find those numbers difficult. They don't really lodge in my head. What stays in my head is every second girl child born today has 50% chance of living to be a centenarian. By the middle of this century, there will be half a million centenarians in the greater UK. At the end of the century, there'll be a million people, a million people 100 years old living in the UK. That's one big city. And when you look around the world, it's a really complicated picture. In the States, uh, by 2050, the middle of this century, there'll be 89 people, 89 people over the age of uh, 65. It's a really complicated picture because those people are, some of them are the richest people in history. They're the richest percentage of population. So 
uh, I worked out the other day, they've got $2.3 trillion between them, which pretty much means they could fly us all to the moon and back. Worked it out on the back of an envelope. But also within that, there's a whole pile of people who are fragile and becoming vulnerable and their bodies are changing and uh, it's a complicated picture. So, when people meet to talk about changing ageing, changing demographic, what happens, they tend to talk about all this top stuff. What are we going to do to address this, what they usually talk of as a challenge, the ageing tsunami, the challenge of old age, the changing demographic. So they talk about we need ministers, and we need more staff, we need more money, we always need more money. Uh, if they do research and evaluation, they'll all of us ask for more research and evaluation. Every research project you ever see says, can we have more research? Can we ask more questions? What they don't talk about is the bigger bit of the iceberg, this stuff at the bottom, the stuff that will really sink the ship. Stereotyping and invisibility, ageism. And the big one, I think, is fear of change because it stops people from thinking. If you're afraid, you don't think straight. So, so what does this mean? What does this change mean in terms of people living longer, more people living for longer? Well, it means that for people who are 50 and they have 40 years ahead, they might plan their lives differently. They might go back to the U3A, they might go to college. More and more people in their 50s might start a second career, a second business, or they might totally change. You know? I work as an artist, I work as an organiser, sometimes I work as a cook, very bad cook, but I'm made up of the sum total of my experience. And if I know at the age of 50 I've got another 40 years, I might go and do something completely different. It affects the generational contract. Somebody was talking about uh, money getting tied up, tied up in housing. So what used to happen is you'd work all your life, you'd save your money, you'd buy your house. You'd pass the money that was in that house to your kids. Gives them a better start. That will change when you are 90, your kids are 70, their kids are 50, their kids are 30, and they've got teenagers. And that's not just you, that's your whole street. So that whole dynamic will change. And what will also shift is the difference between countries. So, uh, last year I got up in Dublin, I'm 50, I'm sort of middle-aged, a bit past middle age. I flew to South Africa, I landed in South Africa eight hours later in the same time zone, and all of a sudden I was six years older than the average age of a grandparent. The average age of a grandparent in South Africa is 44. So there's a big difference in where you're born. And it affects everything, it will affect everything. It will affect entertainment and art, it will affect planning, how do we build cities, towns, how do we... What people buy, that's already happening. The, the Vogue had an edition last week, the 100th edition. They had a, hundred, a centenarian model. Anybody see that? Yeah? Yeah? So it's starting to change. What people spend money on is starting to change what's available and what's possible. Uh, transport and travel, political sector, what's starting to happen in politics is po parties are appealing to generational divide, which is an alarming thing. Health and financial, I'll talk a little bit about. So financial, uh, as the big bubble of population becomes 65 and plus, it has spending money. And it will start to become the influencer of what gets bought and what people want. Um, as more people get older, at the moment, there are uh, six people working for every one person retired. In about 30 years' time, there'll be two people working for every one retired. So there's a complete shift. Um, we might be drawing down pensions for 30 or 40 years. And you can already see this in the papers. You can see this, this people being encouraged to work longer, retire later. Or uh, places like B&Q, where they want older people, people who are 65 and plus, to go and work for them. Because they found out that they're really great people to have in their shop. They can explain things to people in a way that younger people can't. It's okay working past 65 and 70, maybe if you're an academic, or you work on, in a desk. It's not so good if you're a bricklayer. Okay? Working longer is not necessarily going to work for everybody. And health, you see a lot of this. So, the health service that we live in was based on emergency. It was based on acute care. It was based on the fact you'd break something, or you'd be about to burst or you'd, something would happen that was massively traumatic 
and you need to be whizzed into hospital, fixed, and then sent out. But as you all know, what happens is you get a bit arthritic or you get a bit of something and you're not quite as you were before and that, you just live with it. You have to learn to live with it. And so the health system is having to move from dealing with acute to dealing with what they call chronic, living with things that are difficult. Um, and you see that system changing. So you see uh, the localising of care. You see care in the community programmes. You see how, do we, how are people supported to continue their lives and live with whatever medical issue they might have. Um, and you're starting to see the, the movement of people. So, for instance, I'm working with somebody at the moment who had a stroke, is chair-bound, very little movement. Um, her carers, one lives in South Africa and one lives in... Hungary, and it financially makes sense for them to fly over, spend three and a half weeks living and working with Polly, and then to fly back. It's like lads working on the building sites. It's an extraordinary thing that's starting to happen. So we have this kind of view of old age, which is a bit like this. It says that those people entering old age, the people at the bottom of the triangle, we kind of don't need to worry about those because it's a medical view. The people that are in transition, where they're starting to get a bit ill or a bit frail. We can spend some resources on those. And those people that are frail and in high dependency, that's where all the resources and effort and energy and hospital and medical goes. Okay? So it's a medical view of old age. This, I think, is the one we need to move to. So uh, if we start to think of people that are becoming older, entering old age, whatever point of life that is, as a resource, as people who can become responsible for their own care to an extent, as people who are an asset to their community. Maybe uh, the amount of people that will need transitional care, or maybe the people that need specialist care, um, the resources will go a lot further. In a way, it's about saying it's all about self-help. It's about how do we help ourselves? How do we change the way that we view old aging? How do we view getting older? so that we're able to help ourselves, which is where we get to arts. So, uh, Richard Smith, Medical Journal 2002, said this lovely thing. He said, if health is about adaptation, understanding and acceptance, then the arts might be more potent than anything that medicine has to offer. If health is about adaptation, understanding and acceptance, then the arts might be more potent than anything that medicine has to offer. Okay. Anything that you want to ask me at this point? So far, so good? Yeah, we'll keep going? Okay. You're not asleep yet. Good. All right. So let's have a talk about the arts. So normally, when people get to talk about the arts, they go, um, I'm going to explain the arts. I kind of think it's pointless, so I'm just going to show you some when I get a glass of water. Okay, I'm going to jump around and come back, which I can do. So, we'll talk about what art does in a minute, but what I want to talk about first, just so I can make this work, is what's unique about creativity and art making when you're older. And there's really four things. So the first one is that you've always made things. You might always have painted, you might always have sung songs, you might be Tony Morrison, you might be Bridget Riley, you might be Mick Jagger, all right? It's what you do, it's your job, you make stuff. It might be that you've always made stuff with your kids, you've always painted a bit, it might be that you've always baked, you've always made costume, clothes, it might be that. The other thing that happens that's completely unique to creating things as you get older is that your circumstances change. So, uh, it might be that you are a fiddle player and you become a bit arthritic. You can't quite play the way you used to. It might be that you're a dancer and you love going dancing, but you know, you're not quite so stable on your feet anymore. It might be that you're a 25 year old ballet dancer and your body starts to change shape. It might be that the people that you used to go to things with, they're not there anymore. So there's a whole pile of reasons why, why things change. Or it might be 
that you find the chance to get involved in making things or dancing or making music for the first time in your life. But you bring to that experience a lifetime of experience. Okay? That makes sense? Yes, yeah. Yep. Like Esme. Esme taught everybody that I know in Dublin to swim. Um, and was always kind of involved in the arts. But in, when she was about 65, 66, she just had a bit more time. So she started making things. Um, and the fourth thing I think is different. The fourth thing is about what happens between... Uh, do you want me to test that? No, it's... What happens between you and the art? So, uh, does anybody know Kitty Shan? The woman with the folded arms? Lives up in, towards Guidor. Uh, so she's a kind of living library of traditional music. And uh, there are enormous number of musicians would go and see her every now and then to learn some new tunes or find out a variation. Um, and what happens is that the, it's like when you read a book at different times in your life. Yeah? It changes its importance to you. There's a difference between reading Great Expectations when you're 19 and reading it when you're 61. So this relationship is is really interesting thing and not many people do an awful lot of looking at that. Let's see if this works. play it to the end? Yeah. I play it at the end then, I'll come back to it because otherwise I lose my thread again. Uh, the reason for showing you that is to talk about what art does. I can talk about what art does or I can just show it to you. It carries an enormous amount of information in a very complicated way that works on your head and your heart and your emotions and your body in all sorts of ways. Um, it's the killer application. And that particular piece is from a company called Young at Heart Chorus. They started as a, a, it's a lunch club in Chicago where um, an artist whose name's gone out of my head because my head's like that, um, basically played the piano and then started teaching people pop songs. And then realized that if you teach old people pop songs like Lost in the Supermarket by The Clash, <laughs> it has a very different resonance. If it's sung by a 90 year old who can't remember all the lyrics, okay? And the reason he did that, his name is Bob Kilman, is because he came from a radical theatre company based in New York, whose history is 
about 100 years of radical theatre making. So his lineage, his tradition, is to be a radical theatre maker. And so it was natural for him, when he found himself earning a few bob playing the piano, to try and see how far he could push it. And what's interesting about Bob is he's a pain in the neck in rehearsals. Okay, he doesn't take second best. The bar is set really high, and he expects that those people that turn up aspire. Okay, if a thing's worth doing, you do it excellently. So, that's the first bit. Second bit is, what I think that clip is useful for is to remind us that actually, the thing about art making in old ages, there is no them and us. It's not a foreign country, it's us just a bit later. Okay, it's not like working with youth, and it's not like working with another population, and it's not like working in gender or sexuality. It's all us. It's all of us, just a bit later. So that makes it really easy to do, because all you need to do is go, what makes our life great, and how can we do more of that? Okay, so then, just to praise I flew through what's different about art making, and I'm now playing around with this. I've got interested in what makes, what is creative ageing? firstly, because I don't really understand. And the stuff that's really good, what's it got in common? Okay, all of those companies that I showed you at the beginning that are in Northern Ireland, what do they do? What, what's common to what they do? Because some of them work in arts and care and some of them work in sheltered accommodation and some of them work with older people with disabilities and some of them work with 50-year-olds and some of them work with 92-year-olds and some work through U3A and some do, it's really, really, really broad spectrum. So the most interesting stuff, what's it got in common? And the first thing is that every single entity that's involved is on a journey. Frankly, I can put that another way. None of the people that are involved really know what they're doing. And I mean that in the most positive way possible. So that means the buildings like this that welcome people in, the commissioners that support people and give them the money to make something, the artists and the individuals, I'm never sure how that works anymore, nobody really knows what they're doing because it's historically unprecedented. This is whole new territory. Okay? There's a whole reason there's not fantastic statistics on people over the age of 70. There weren't that many previously. And also they weren't economically an advantage, so there wasn't that much research. So it's, it's a changing environment. So. If the thing is any good, everybody's trying to figure out what they're doing. And then I've kind of picked seven. So, I'll fly through them. Um, really good projects, really interesting projects, really interesting projects have individual agency. Individual agency, I think, is best measured in time. It's that bit where you forget what you're doing. You go to a dance and all of a sudden you realise it's three hours later. You paint the picture and you look up and you've forgotten to go and pick up the grandkids. Yeah? That makes sense? Yeah. Um, and it happens in all sorts of different art forms. It can happen in groups, it can happen on your own, but it's about loss of time, individual agency. Empathy and exchange is about really what we did this morning. So when you come in, I'm willing to change the way that the day works in order to fit to you. So this is a picture from a piece of theatre by a company called Spare Tire, and that's what the theatre looks like. It's made in touch, and it's made in bubbles, and it's made in uh, texture and textiles. Um, it's also about artists changing their mind halfway through. So these were a series of portraits commissioned from a photographer in Dublin called Aidan Kelly, and they were portraits of people with tattoos, old fellas with tattoos was where he started. He thought, uh, tattoos are the only mark you make on your skin that time doesn't make, so we'll take photographs of old people. And that means maybe people come into a gallery that don't normally come into a gallery. And as he started photographing, he realised that actually that wasn't the people that had the photographs. Quite often there were people like Kathleen, who at the age of 50-something, having been a full-time carer for a mum, her mum died, and she got a tattoo to mark the passing and to say, OK, it's my life now, I can stop being a full-time carer and I can do other things. And we got really surprised about who had tattoos and where and when they got them and how they got them. So there was a shift between where... We start in where we ended up, between empathy and exchange. Disruption is really important. There's, for those people that use Twitter, there's a hashtag called uh, disruptive aging, which the American Association of Retired People started. And disruption is about this idea that we tell ourselves one story of about how we get older. 
There's only one. You, you do really great, and then you drop off. Yeah, that's the story. And so disruption is all about changing that story, breaking it apart, saying it's not the only story. Uh, so this is an orchestra that I started in the National Concert Hall in Dublin. And one of the things they disrupted was the National Concert Hall because they would go in and use the photocopier. They'd wander in off the street, go into the office and use the photocopier. And uh, they did that because they were the National Concert Hall's orchestra. Um, they were people who joined because they maybe never played in an orchestra. They might have played an instrument on their own. It was really good fun to play with 40 people. And because it was good fun, they started deciding to play outside of the National Concert Hall. And so one evening they decided to play on Houston Railway Station for a couple of hours. And they completely caused chaos on the railway station. People going for the train decided they'd go for a wee dance instead. And uh, trains were missed and words were had. And great fun was had and it was life enhancing. <coughs> Making, disrupting things brings back a bit of life, a bit of risk. And that disruption can take place anywhere. So this is a company in Tasmania called, uh, called Creature Tales. And Creature Tales specialise in chaos. So they do carnival in care homes. They're the only company I know who would ever do this. Who would take uh, acrobats into a care home and, you know, in their bra and their, their top and go... Um, can you paint me belly button? Right? So, uh, so that's, you know, that's the, the artist getting ready to do the performance in the care home and the lovely lady who's 90-something who's got Alzheimer's is helping her get ready, helping her paint. And what that does is it brings risk into a care home. Name a care home where people would be encouraged to fall over in a safe, secure environment, but as part of the circus. Disruption, generally exploratory. So this is quite often that you don't quite know where you're going when you start. Um, this was a knitting project um, in Carlo in a sheltered accommodation where we discovered lots of people knitted. And so the guys there and the ladies made things that were sold through the local Oxfam and Oxfam took the money and used that for whatever Oxfam cared for at the time. And so what it did was it changed the story about who lived in a care home. The people in the care home were making things which raised money, which cared for people who were more vulnerable than themselves. Yeah? Yeah. Um, I also want to mention Anne Bay's thing. So Anne is amazing. Lock her up and have a route. But she wrote this book called Forget Aging. And it's not called Forget Aging, it's called Forget Memory. <laughs> ha! I'm, you're not the only people with memory problems. Trust me. It's called Forget Memory. And uh, what it started from was that she would do storytelling projects in residential care with people that were kind of quite vulnerable and frail. And she realised that there was a focus on reminiscence and getting people to remember. And she thought, this is really frustrating because actually that's the bit that's going. The memory bit. The imagination bit. The let's make things up. The and, yes, what if, can we, that's of course, yeah, let's go that way. That bit isn't fading away. The ability to find dates and times and fix is difficult. Um, and so she's invented this whole program called Time Slips, which is really worth having a look at, and I recommend it. Um, exploratory is more to do with that all the organisations that are involved and the individuals are going to go on a journey to somewhere where they don't know where the end is. So... Um, this was a project that started in a, a heritage property. So people explored the building visually. A group of craft makers went and made things from the building. Had an exhibition. More people used the building than normally did. So the Office of Public Works, because it was when Dublin said, oh, we'll do that again, because actually more people come in. And then uh, by about the third year, this group had found another group in Birmingham and another group in Cornwall and they'd started to design by emailing each other so they'd learned to use the internet and they were sending designs to the University of Falmouth where they were printing things out and the project just had continued to grow way beyond anything that anybody had ever imagined. So the sixth one is vulnerability. Projects need to have vulnerability. It's not just risk, it's a little more than risk. It's the fact that you've, you find yourself to a place where it's not quite comfortable. 
And the reason that's important is as our bodies change and as we get older and as things start to move, things are not quite comfortable all the time. So we need to let that be. Just let it be present. It's the, the unspoken, the unannounced. It might come up in a dance project. It might be vulnerability in the person performing, or it might be vulnerability in the artist saying, I, I don't quite know what I'm doing and where I'm going. And the seventh one is about connecting and convening. So this is kind of the trajectory for the next 10 minutes or so. So far, so good? Yes. Okay, is this useful? Yes. Okay. To most of you, but not everybody. We'll get to the everybody after. Connecting and convening. Arts projects and connecting and convening. I um, have to start with Grayson Perry. Grayson Perry, Turner Award winning artist, makes lovely pots. Um, said this really smart thing. He said, you know, artists are not the only creative people. You get creative scientists, you get creative town planners, you get creative cooks. It's really important that artists don't put themselves on a pedestal saying, I'm the only creative person. Otherwise, things don't move. Um, some of you know that I ran the Bieltona Festival. I have a history, I have a habit of running festivals. I, got, I really like festivals because they're places where people go to do things they wouldn't ordinarily do. Uh, anybody been to a food festival? Yeah? Okay, anybody try new food at the food festival they would never eat at any other time in their lives? Yeah? Okay. You go to a dance festival, you do the same thing. Festivals encourage people to do things they wouldn't do in their normal lives. Um, but they also encourage organisations to do that. An organisation might try something out for a festival that it wouldn't try out for the rest of the year or might not be on its remit. Festivals have promotional, social, economic and cultural function. So they raise money, they make money, they sell tickets, they bring people together and they say, hey, we're on. And their absolute genius is about getting people involved. So, Beltana, uh, Festival Across the Republic, quick headlines. Uh, when I started in 1996, it was 52 events. And by the time I finished in 2013, it was 3,500. Huge mix of what people were doing. Very different kind of work. Some people working in care homes. Some people working in national cultural institutions, some people doing multi-annual projects, some people doing once-off, some people doing things with people who are really, really healthy, and some people doing things with people that were really, really frail. Very different, very varied, and the reason we could do that is because I didn't try and own it. What I tried to do was nurture it and keep it going. It's a month-long festival, so you can find your way in, and it's about the creativity of older people and people who are exploring what age is. So, as a festival, it commissions new work, it makes things happen, it shows off that they're happening, it brokers partnerships and invitations, and it happens all over the place. So it might be an art centre, it might be in a hospital, it might be on a beach, it might be... So the, the art of it gets made in very different places, and therefore those organisations connect with each other, a bit like you will do today. And they make very different kind of art for very different reasons. So for some people it's about health, for some people it's about fine art practice, for some people it's about having fun. Um, and it's a festival that's made locally. So one of the great advantages of having run Bieltona is that you realise you're in a really privileged position because you are working with people or organisations that work with people whose geography is the size of the bed that they are stuck in, or the table on their hospital bed. But you're also working people who can make it to the cultural centre or the community centre or to the national thing and in some cases people that go touring off around the world. And it gives you an overview and what it makes you realise is that what holds all of that together isn't planning and isn't schedules, it's something else. Uh, I felt emotional and privileged to be involved in something so immensely positive. Bieltona makes me believe that people are good. What holds it all together is culture. It's the attitude, it's the way you, it's the fact that when you come in this morning, I'll make you a cup of tea if you want one, I'll help you move the chairs. It's the atmosphere in the room. Um, 2009, 10, we started this piece of research. It exists. If you go to the Bieltona website, you can have a look at it. It says all the things that you already know, so I'm going to fly through them. That uh, the festival had encouraged more people to take part, it had raised, it had an effect on individuals. People started to feel 
that they've got a new lease of life. I'm a widow and I live alone. It's marvellous to have something to get out for, to get involved in, to forget your aches and pains, get completely immersed. It affects community. The walls of the hospital broke down because people from outside were coming in and we were occasionally going out. Um, it affects institutions, so different organisations, non-governmental organisations and state agencies and services started to work together because there was an excuse for them to do so. Um, and Bielton had all sorts of successes, but partly because of its size. In 2006 or 7, uh, the Irish economy tanked. It kind of went and money that we had to run the festival disappeared. We didn't have that much anyway, but now we had even less. And it created a really interesting challenge. How, when more people are getting involved and it's getting all very exciting and people are getting involved because it's interesting and they see their friend doing something, they want some of that, how do you keep that going? So uh, initially, Sally, you about there somewhere? Yeah, yeah hi. So uh, Sally and I dreamt up this idea, which was about what I was struggling with was how do you, how do you get people involved? How, what's the question that you ask people that makes them go, yeah, I'll do that, I'll try that? It's not about money, because I can't pay for anything. It's about, how, it's about an invitation. How do you ask for help? So uh, we dreamt up this idea, and the idea was very simple. The idea was, we're going to ask people in active retirement groups to join a choir, and then we're going to ask them to get up on the last Sunday in May at dawn and go and sing on a beach. Okay, so this morning I woke up at about six o'clock and it was daylight. All right, dawn, it turns out, is about 20 past four. So what we were going to do was go to people and say, would you like to get up at half four in the morning or four o'clock, drive to a beach, stand on the beach and sing? Oh, you do a bit of rehearsal beforehand so you know what you're singing. So we tried it out the first year in, uh, where were we, Rathmonad? No, um, in Ishon. In Ishon, yeah. And we thought, okay, there'll be the people that are involved in family and friends. And 600 people turned up. Somebody driven from Manor Hamilton, somebody else had camped out on the beach. There was a bunch of scouts that were over on the other peninsula who'd stayed overnight to come and see this thing. And what we realised was asking people to do something completely ludicrous and a bit outside of your normal makes your life rich and enhancing. And so this gradually grew, Dawn Chorus grew. Um, and in County Carlo, this happened. So a guy called John O'Keefe uh, persuaded uh, his active retirement group to take part. And they said, but you know, we don't really get up at dawn in Carlo. So nine o'clock, that's kind of dawn, isn't it? And he went, okay, that's fine. And then he said, we'd like to involve the local school kids. And, yeah, that's cool. Uh, we'd like to involve the fire brigade they're going to make rainbows. So I went down to see him at that point because I was a little bit worried about the early onset. And it turns out that he had firemen with hoses fiddling around to make the perfect rainbow by blowing the water across the river. He, what he'd done is he'd got the whole town involved around this event. And he'd done that at the time that the economy had tanked. So anybody under 60 plus was wandering around wondering what they were going to do with the rest of their lives now that they were going to be paying a mortgage forever. Anybody over was going, sure, that happened before, and we lived. What's important? What's important is we get out, and we get up early, and we go and sing on the beach, or we sing on the river. He made his group the centre of community. He built community around it. So that ran for a couple of years, and then he stopped. And that has led to all the things that I'm doing at the moment. So 10 minutes, and I'll finish off tops. Um, with Creative Inter Aging International, we're looking at how creative projects are really prototypes for better living. Um, I'm not going to talk through that. One of the ways we're doing this is working in South East London, so this takes up quite a bit of time. And what we're doing there is working with a company called Entelechy Arts, the Albany, which is a space a bit like here, art space, and the borough of Lewisham. And what we've done is set up residential daycare, uh, not residential, sorry, daycare. So people come there for a day and then go home. Uh, and people describe it like this. They say it's the kind of stereo smashing thing that sticks two knitting needles up to at anyone who dares assume daycare for older people is about flower arranging and endless cups of tea. And we do flower arranging and endless cups of tea. But people also say, this is what society would look like 
If only we scrubbed out ignorance and fear. This is either a unique experiment in provision for the elderly if you write like a bureaucrat, or something as lovely and hopeful as a poem. And I think the reason that it's as lovely and hopeful as a poem is because we also do things like this. We take risks, we build the program around the people that turn up. Uh, there's about 50 people at the moment that come up every Tuesday. They're generally bust in because they can't manage their own transport. They would have Alzheimer's early onset, they'd have dementia, they'd have mobility issues, they would have cognitive dis problems, they may have been uh, in disabled support or assisted living for the whole of their lives. They're a very complex bunch of people. And what we do is celebrate them, celebrate whatever it is that they are. When we talk formally, it's a social and creative engagement program for isolated and vulnerable older people living in the London borough. Yeah, it's that language. Yeah. And when we talk to health, it's this kind of language, referral route. So people find their way there. So the squares in the middle is Tuesday session. They're self-referred, they decide that they like it, and they come along. They see it in the, fest in the brochure for the art centre. Family and friends, the voluntary sector, age, UK, minds, those organisations say, we've got somebody, can they come along? And the deal is you basically have to be able to take yourself to the loo and feed yourself. People come for the day. Um, we run it with volunteers and a couple of artists. And gradually, this idea is spreading over the borough. So what we're starting on at the moment is a series of uh, daycare, but also art projects in sheltered accommodation. And also a film club that will work very differently. And what we're trying to do is set them up the way we set up Bielton. So we don't own it, we nurture them along. It's like community grease and glue. Um, so that this can happen. Uh, somebody who's home alone, depressed and anxious after a hospital stay, starts attending the Tuesday session, meet me, because their social care team recommend it. They work with a poet. They make a little performance in one of our tea dances. They get a book of poems printed. They go on tour with a group of poets that they met on a Tuesday. And that type of pattern, getting involved, doing something new, and then seeing where it takes you, is regular. So is this. A chemical release in Dalton Marsh. Because at takeoff, they never do a countdown anymore. It's too stressful. They just go. So that is a little part of a film that we've been making, which started with people talking about falls. It started with people talking about isolation, living on your own. Living on your own is a bit like being in a spaceship. How come people in spaceships get looked after so much better than we do? And gradually, it's become this little film about space and being 60, 70, 80, or uh, actually 91. Um, and the next version of it will go on Channel 4. 
it would go out as part of a dance season because we found some money to make that happen. And so that creative driven bit of research, the going where we don't know where we're going, is ending up with some really interesting things that, that carry all sorts of complicated information. Um, And I guess as a kind of quick summary of what's driving what we're doing in, in South London. So it's art making is embraced and central. It's about art making first. And then where it takes us, we'll see. It's about embracing negative capabilities. So negative capability is this idea that sometimes when you don't know how to do something and you come at it for the first time sideways, you'll find a whole different way of doing it than anybody else. And in my world at the moment, what that means is uh, somebody who is a regular user of mental health and manages their own condition, which might be extreme anxiety, but they know how to manage it. So extreme that there are days when they don't leave the house, when they're in real trouble. Generally, they manage their anxiety really well, self-manage. When they meet somebody who's just had a heart attack, who's a 65-year-old man who used to be the big guy, who's feeling really lost, because now he's no longer the big guy, he's some guy whose left side doesn't work. The people that manage their own mental health are really important in giving him a route, a way back into living, a way into managing what you have to deal with, in being resilient. Um, and so we have a whole pile of different projects that are starting to kind of connect together and do some interesting things. What they're really asking is this, who owns care? How does creativity accompany us we grow frail? If you can't make it to Tuesday, and you can't make it to this kind of session, then how can you still get involved in your own creativity? And it's popping up projects like this. So this is BED. BED started, as people say, and I'm, I went out on my scooter, and uh, I tried to have a car. Nobody talked to me at all. It's just because I'm on a scooter. Started with people saying, since I got grey hair, nobody looks me in the eye in the street. Nobody makes eye contact with me. So, uh, after many kind of bits of conversations, it ended up with this. What, what happened was, on a Wednesday, which is market day, people would arrive at market and discovered that there were 90-year-olds abandoned in their beds around the market, with no signage. Just, yeah, like a hospital bed. And this is what happened. People would walk like this. They'd go... <laughs> and then they'd stand about here. And then... If you were standing around here, you could have an extraordinary conversation about what it was they thought they were seeing. Okay? They'd tell you about their granny, they'd tell you about their auntie, they'd tell you about themselves, they'd tell you about fear, they'd tell you about being afraid of being old. Okay? This works like theatre works. It is theatre. It's a disruptive object. And now, uh, it's going on tour. So it will pop up at summer arts festivals, you know those ones where you take the kids and there's nice and blooms, there'll also be 90-year-olds abandoned in the street. Because if we don't do that, the conversation stays in rooms like this. Because art should be sometimes provocative. We also didn't tell the police. <laughs> huh? Yeah, 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 you know it, yeah. So uh, it, there was actually there was a there was a performance arts festival going on, but people think performance art is twenty year olds because you know creativity and youth get matched together. We don't work with twenty year olds. Um, what happened? There was a beautiful story though, so I'll, I'll tell you for a minute. So uh, four kids walked past that, and then they walked to the nearest thing that looked like an official desk, which turned out to be the library. The library's in the background. They walked into the library and they went, uh, excuse me. They plucked up courage and said, excuse me, um, we'd like to report a crime. People are abandoning old people in the streets. I can't wait to see... So this is going... The first outing is on Saturday. It goes to Brighton Festival. We've done a whole pile of work with Brighton Festival, so they don't announce it in the usual way that they would. It now is a second bed, because when we made the first bed, people started making an idea, a quilt for it, and the knitters made this thing for it, and now there's a second bed which works differently. We'll see how it goes. We don't quite know what we're doing. We've been very careful because, uh, the, you know, Elsie's really frail. So who knows what's going to happen as we go out over the summer. Um, we are learning lots from the people that we work with all the time. Cynthia has chronic arthritis. She spends most of her day like that. 
And so when I get Cynthia involved in a dance session, I have to watch Cynthia and figure out what Cynthia can do because Cynthia's teaching me. Um, and, um, yeah, there, there's lots of interesting things happening. So uh, Elsie and Fred, very briefly. Um, uh, Elsie, 96, I think. Fred, 70 something. Um, last week, Elsie died. She had a fall, she got pneumonia, she died. She died on Monday night. On Tuesday morning, Fred came in to the session, like a regular Tuesday, he got the bus, he came in and said, Elsie's died. And I know Fred's challenged in all sorts of different ways. So I was on the phone and I found the emergency care worker and I do all of that. And what I realized is the social, the, the official care had kicked in. So she died in hospital, the bereavement council in the hospital was available, bereavement services are there, but there was one phone number in his phone book and there was one friend from 25 years ago who used to be a neighbour. There was no informal care. His informal care was coming in on a Tuesday. Um, and that's really what creative agency is playing around with, that's what we're trying to get our heads around at the moment. It's what we're trying to make projects, prototypes, creative experiments which are about a creative marriage of formal and informal care. They're about saying to 50-year-olds and 40-year-olds, how do you fall in love with your older self? Or 60 and 70-year-olds? Or 80-year-olds? How do you fall in love with your older self? They're saying to communities of people that a community without a memory gets sick, so what are those things, what are the stories that we put in the community to hold it all together? And we're trying to make art making really normal. Extraordinary, but really normal. It's a thing that you do. It's a way of exploring the world. It's how we understand. And that means we sit in the middle of all sorts of different organisations like I hear today. U3A, um, Health, Arts, Local Authority. All of those organisations and us are trying to figure out what may be happening next. It's about relationships. It's about exchanging expertise with all sorts of people that you might not ordinarily come into contact with. Complexity theories and town planners and single old men and happy families. It's about making things in art centres and around your kitchen table. And to make that happen, culture trumps strategy. You can plan all of this out and, you know, so I could plan out this morning. What happens this morning? I plan it all out, you come in, it's like, plan out the window. Change it. Yeah? But if the atmosphere in the room is that it's okay that we'll run all the way through to lunch, we can cope with it. If the culture is that, yes, we want to do this, we will figure out a way of doing it. So it's always about relationships. It's about whether or not we're okay together to kind of move in the right direction, even though we don't quite know where we're going. And the problem with that, though, is that sometimes those relationships become a bit fixed and a bit exclusive. So you need the regular thing, but you need something that comes in occasionally. Uh, and aging is not different from any other time of your life. You know this. Okay, so all those other issues, poverty, gender, sexuality, finance, class, education, all of that stuff still happens in old age. Still happens when you get to 70, 80, and 90. It's still there. But it might be, and this is the thing I find most interesting, that it's where we can bridge some of those. So I have people that come in on a Tuesday who uh, had very high powered jobs but had a stroke. And so they are now struggling with that. I had people who didn't have high powered jobs, had mums or parents or, you know, signed on the whole time. But at this point, 65 plus, 70 plus, 80 plus, if the atmosphere of the room is right, if the culture is right, the engagement is very different. Um, it's all about the singing and dancing. And partly it's about trying to make this work. So, um, this is about as much as I get into strategy at the moment, how to work. If uh, we're afraid of something, then we tend to ignore it. Okay? We kind of go, we'll walk past the bed. Yeah, we'll go to that spot past the bed. If we walk to that spot past the bed, if we ignore it, actually we get more afraid of it because we don't have any way of understanding it. We don't, we're ignorant about it. We don't engage with it in any way at all. We are just not curious. And so we get more afraid of the things that we're not curious about and we just put them away. And that's somebody said about isolation. That, I think, is how isolation happens, partly. 
So we need to work the other way. And the other way is to inspire, to do something that's exciting, that you get cute. What's that thing there? How do you do that? Can you show me how to do that? Show me how to do that. Show me how to do that dance. OK, here's the steps. Hey, look, I can do a dance. Come see me do a dance. So what happens is people get curious. They learn to do something. They share it with other people. They show it off. And those other people get interested in what they're doing. Okay? It's partly a thing called change theory, if you're interested in that. But it's also it's a virtual circle. It's how things move. And so really, we're aiming at this how process and product merge seamlessly into the same breathing pattern of social sculpture. Since participatory work's purpose as art is to be alive, to take risks, to be bold, to question, to disrupt, to challenge, to live. So, let's just let it breathe. Without having to answer all the problems, let's be evolutionary, not revolutionary. Which brings me to this bit. I talked an awful lot. I don't normally talk that much. I'm quite quiet, really. Um, it's now 5 to 1. Um, is there any house lights? No, I don't. Okay. So, I think now's a good time to take a bit.